Okay, everyone. Um, we are going to go ahead with today for those of you guys who are logged in already. Um, we probably will have an issue with some people not being able to get in because of the WebEx problem. Um, but we'll move forward with today's presentation. And if we can't make it all the way through, um, we will make sure that we either reschedule this or that we have um, a recording available of the presentation later on. So um, if you hear from anybody that's having trouble log in, please let them know that we will try to do our best um, to get the recording um, up and available or we will reschedule. But we'll contact everyone who registered through WebEx um, to get this going. Um, so Mitch is not able to get in, but Ed, um, do you have Sarah's introduction? Nope, Mitch I has the one that Sarah has provided. I apologize. That's okay. I've got it right here. Um, so Sarah, if you're okay with me introducing you, I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm totally fine with you introducing me. <laughs> Thank you everybody for joining us today. This is the second um, in our series of Artists in the Know with Sarah Conley Odenkirk. Um, Sarah is the founder of Art Converge and has been um, practicing law in the area of fine art for more than 25 years. Um, she advises clients in transactional and policy matters related to all aspects of art business um, in private and public realms and provides a cultural strategy guidance through a legal lens. She's the author of a surprisingly interesting book about contracts that's that's the actual title of the book, a surprisingly interesting book about contracts for artists and other creatives. Um, and she is also the publisher of an online database and the comprehensive resource guide for public art and private development. Uh, she's a frequent speaker at professional conferences, both in the legal and art fields. Um, and we're really lucky to have her with us today. Um, so before I turn it over to her, just a couple of reminders, keep yourself on mute during the uh, presentation. And if you have questions, please type them into the chat box. And once we go through the 30 minute presentation, we will come back and go through all of your questions at the end. Uh, thank you, Sarah, please take it away. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for asking me to be here today. And I'm sorry that we're having some technical issues, but we'll hopefully get through this. And if not, I've got it all written out so we can do it again. Um, I'm just going to start briefly um, with a review quickly of what we did last session. We talked about basic business practices. Um, we discussed the importance of having dedicated workspace for um, taking care of the business aspects of your art practice. We talked about the importance of having a well thought out plan and budget. We talked about protecting yourself against risk through insurance and incorporation strategies. And then we also talked about the critical role of contracts in doing business. So along with this last element here, the uh, doing business with contracts, uh, it, there is another critical element, uh, and that is in managing conflicts, which is what we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to run through a number of things here. And, and as you have questions, please do uh, make a note of them. And hopefully we can get to those at the end. Um, my understanding is that these are recorded. So if you didn't hear last week's presentation and you'd like to do that, I'm sure that you can access that through um, uh, through the, uh, the website. Um, and uh, I understand as well, this will be recorded. So if you miss anything, you can go back and listen again. All right. So conflicts are an, an integral part of doing business. This is a really important thing to understand and recognize because um, I think people instantly shy away from conflict, which I understand I do the same as well, even though I am a lawyer. Um, but rather than viewing conflict as an evidence of failure, try to view um, conflict instead as an opportunity to better communicate, refine your relationships, and ultimately end up with a better outcome than you might have had otherwise. That said, we don't want too much conflict. What is the best bet to avoid conflicts? I'm sure at this point you can guess what I'm going to say. Contracts. So um, contracts 
this is something that we mentioned last week as well. Um, and I will continue to repeat this over and over again until everybody is tired of hearing me be the broken record on this, but contracts should not be viewed as the first step toward litigation. Rather, contracts should be viewed as the best way to clarify obligations and intentions uh, and to ensure that there is a clear and mutually agreeable way to address every aspect of a project, but certainly conflicts. Uh, so again, rather than going immediately to that litigation spot, uh, people should focus on uh, the way in which contracts allow you to establish a, a mode of communication so that you can maybe avoid some of those more intense conflicts. So in order to prepare yourself to enter into an agreement, you need to establish a framework and a tone. The best way to set a positive and productive tone is to emphasize three things, communications, empathy, and time. So let's go through each one of those. Communications goes just uh, beyond just being able to talk on the phone or text, uh, but though those kinds of uh, communication tools are definitely necessary and you want to make sure you have everybody's contact information. But there needs to be some structure established from the very beginning of a, a relationship. And that structure might include um, establishing a point person who will be the primary contact for an agreement and, and the project and really any communications that need to happen uh, before, during, and after. Uh, having regular check-ins. So agreeing on how often to have check-in meetings for some projects it's more necessary than others. Um, but making sure that you've got those regular check-ins scheduled, that'll help keep everybody on track and provide a regular time to communicate. And finally, having mutually agreeable milestones will not only help manage the project process, but also establish points at which payment is due, um, especially if payments are being split up over the course of the project. So those milestones can serve as really good uh, major markers where you can reassess where you are and whether there are any issues that need to be addressed at that point. The second element that I mentioned is empathy. Um, and again, I'm going to sound like a broken record on this. Um, empathy is really important when engaging in um, collaborative relationships or really any contractual relationships, because in order to best understand how to position yourself and get the best deal for yourself, you really need to spend some time thinking about um, the other party and, and put yourself in their shoes. So asking questions like, what does the other party want? Um, very important to listen and ask questions that will tell you what the, what the other party's goals are. Uh, and, and again, this is how you can best position yourself to negotiate for what you need and want in an agreement. And then how can you both achieve your goals? This question is also very important um, because, as it turns out, sometimes you can both get what you want. You can very um, frequently end up with a situation where both parties get exactly what it is they want because it's not exactly the same thing and they both will fit within that same project um, goal. The process of effectively communicating and employing empathy to position yourself requires one last element, at least. And that is time. So I will say that haste makes waste, especially in contracts. Um, I, I always um, warn people to be a little suspicious if somebody is rushing you into a contract, pushing you, pressuring you to sign right away. We have to get it done today. It is true that there are often pressures, outside pressures that will um, require that there's some uh, attention put onto the issue of contracts, but but take your time. So that's suggestion number one here. You need time to think through a situation before jumping into an agreement. Um, if you're the one presenting the paperwork to the other party, you also want to make sure you're giving that other party a chance to read through, contemplate, revise, and generally become comfortable with that agreement before they enter into it. Understand that the other party might come back and ask for changes, or you might be asking for changes. And going back and forth does take time. It is generally not something that can happen within a day or two. It's okay for there to be changes to the contract. And we talked a little bit about this uh, last week as well. We'll hit on it again today, which is it's important to ask for what you want. Um, the, the most likely outcome is uh, you either get a yes or no answer as opposed to somebody walking away from the agreement. And as long as the changes aren't detrimental to your position, it's okay to make changes to a contract. Um, 
And in terms of uh, keeping the empathy piece in mind, um, oftentimes everybody involved in an agreement wants to put their thumbprint on it. And so it's important to give people the ability to feel like they are invested and that they've had something to do with that negotiation process and that they're part of the ultimate outcome. Um, and that way they're more committed to the agreement and don't feel like it's been pushed on them. The other important tip here is to plan ahead. Uh, and again, this goes along with the idea that you need time to, to make sure that um, uh, the contract is one that is worth entering into. Especially if you're involving legal counsel, please give them some time. Nine times out of 10, I get calls from clients and they're in a rush for no good reason. They could have called me a month ago when the project got underway to begin with, instead of waiting until the very last minute. So once you're ready to make a contract, um, it's important to involve whoever you're gonna have advising you on that from the very beginning, instead of waiting until the very last minute. All right, so once you're ready to make the contract, um, what, what are the key provisions that will most likely be the center of future conflict? And that's something to focus on in terms of trying to head it off uh, in a proactive way. So let's uh, take a look at a couple of key contract provisions. I'm gonna list them out here and then go through them one at a time. We'll take a look at scope and time for performance, payment terms, change provisions, expenses, and dispute resolution. Um, once we get through these, I'm sure you'll all have some other thoughts about other aspects of contracts, but I think that these uh, appropriately embody the, the main key contract provisions that tend to be um, the place where conflicts start and sit. All right, so first, scope and time. What is the deliverable is really the first question that we have to take a look at. Once we've gotten through the preliminary questions of who are uh, the parties who are involved um, with the agreement um, and in, you know, what time frame are we talking about, what is the deliverable? What is it that you're being asked to produce? Um, what's the final deliverable looking like as well as what it looks like along the way? Um, what is the full scope of the work and the subject of this agreement? What does this project look like? And when does it need to be delivered? Really important to understand from the very beginning before you could get into any other aspects of figuring out the details of your contract. Um, what is the schedule for that performance? Next is the payment terms. And of course, payment terms is what everybody thinks of as being the only thing that people fight over because it's money, but that's not true, uh, though it is one of the definitely one of the uh, main areas to focus on. So back to this idea of milestones. Milestones are a clear point at which payments are usually due. Uh, it's a way for each party to be sure that the project is moving along as planned. And clear milestones are very helpful for heading off problems. It's important not to work too far ahead of what you're getting paid for as well. So especially for artists who are dealing in um, a commission sort of situation, if you're putting money into each um, aspect of the project along the way, you wanna make sure you're adhering to those milestones and that those milestones are budgeted for in a way that will uh, ensure that you're protected as you go forward through the project. The schedule for payment is determined generally by when deliverables need to be completed and delivered. Um, the milestones should be tied to a schedule, and this can be specific dates or periods of time between the milestones that allow for the timely completion of each step. So sometimes it'll be that a project needs to be delivered at a particular time or a performance is going to happen at a particular time. Sometimes there's a little bit more flexibility, um, and oftentimes the best way to establish that schedule is to look at what the end delivery date needs to be and back up from there. So you can figure out what, um, you know, what time is needed, when do you need to start in order to meet that deadline, um, given all of the steps that need to be taken in between all of the milestones. And last I'll mention here is the invoicing process. Um, invoicing is a key business task that's often required in order to get paid. And you need to pay attention to the invoicing procedures. These can differ from job to job. Um, different municipalities or companies or individuals have different ways of processing payments. And so you might need to become um, a vendor for that particular 
uh, organization or municipality. You might need to adhere to particular invoicing uh, procedures in order to fit into their billing system. Um, it's important here to also understand what the time frame is between your invoicing and when you're to get paid. If you're expecting that that payment's going to be turned around right away, you might be disappointed when you find out that they process payments you know, every 30 days or, or even longer in some cases. Um, additionally, sometimes in order to invoice, it's necessary to prove that you've paid all of your subcontractors. So if you're working with other people as well, uh, sometimes the client will require that you provide waivers uh, for liens or for other uh, potential claims that subcontractors could make for work that they've provided to you as well. All right, next um, topic is change. And we've really got two different kinds of change that tend to come up um, in, in art projects. One would be change orders. So change orders are used to make changes to the project parameters along the way. This can be for things like materials, processes, costs. So anything that's really affecting the ability to um, create the project that's been contracted for. And then you've got more general um, changes that might happen. Uh, this might be to, to adjust really anything in the contract um, or to add new elements to the scope. Um, and in this case, we would look toward um, uh, the section of the contract that talks about amendments to a contract. Generally speaking, amendments need to be signed by both parties, but sometimes it'll only be the party against whom that amendment is going to be um, applied that needs to sign. Um, but again, the difference between the change orders and the amendments, change orders tend to be more project based and amendments tend to be more generally contract based. These are important um, areas in terms of potential conflict, of course, because oftentimes there will be some verbal communications, maybe during those check in meetings, changes are made um, verbally and then not committed to writing and there could be some challenges down the road or misremembering. Um, so it's it's important that when you do have those conversations that um, that address changes to the project or changes to the overall agreement that that's put in writing properly. Expenses. So, of course, um, expenses are involved in creating the projects to begin with and, and are involved as compensation in the contract to begin with. But also conflicts, if they go too far, can start to cost uh, one or both parties a lot of money. Damages uh, can result from a breach of an agreement um, or if one party causes a loss for the other through their actions. And in the event of a breach, the breaching party may be liable for the non-breaching party for damages caused by the breaching party. So that's, this, that, that's the point at which we start to see those uh, potential expenses around conflict really go up. Um, this might be the cost of completing the agreement, um, the amount paid out to the breaching party, but it might also include any loss that the non-breaching party suffers as a result of the breach. So additional costs, so uh, replacing the artist, um, uh, replacing the artwork or the performance, or somehow um, having to figure out a solution to whatever is the consequence of one of the parties breaching. Indemnification clauses are something that people either um, are completely confused by or skim over completely and don't read and just sign. But they're important to pay attention to because the indemnification clauses require that one party, the indemnifying party, um, make the other party whole in the event that there is a breach and the indemnifying party or any of its agents or employees do anything to um, create uh, liability for um, the other party, for the non-breaching the non party. Costs uh, that are incurred in the course of resolving a breach of contract action or an action by a third party, somebody outside of the contract that's that's uh, uh, filing a lawsuit or making a claim. Um, so any of these costs will um, cost that will cost the non-breaching party money, might uh, which might include things like collection fees, fines, penalties, additional costs for site or location um, of the performance or the or the project costs of going through dispute resolution, um, and of course, one big cost that everybody needs to pay attention to is attorney's fees. Whether or not you are the party who is seeking them, it's important to understand attorney's fees can exceed even the damages um, sometimes in, in contract disputes. Um, attorney's fees should be reasonable, 
uh, but they can still be quite high. And usually a provision allowing for the recovery of attorney's fees serves as an extra disincentive to both parties um, in terms of getting into conflicts or prolonging those conflicts. Um, but an important thing to understand is that if you don't have a provision in your contract that allows for the recovery of attorney's fees, the only other way to get attorney's fees is if there's a statutory provision on the books. If neither one of those exist and you have a conflict, you will not be able to recover your attorney's fees. And that can be also something difficult for artists, even if they might be able to get together the money to pursue the claim. If it's not something that's recoverable in the end, it can make um, pursuing any sort of contract dispute um, overwhelmingly expensive. Okay, so dispute resolution, we touched on this last week as well. Um, but I would, um, I would like to just touch on it again today um, because uh, these are obviously important ways to resolve any disputes that come up and in, in different ways of dealing with conflict. So the first level, of course, is mutual agreement. And this is the thing that I really encourage people to pay attention to first is to really try to work things out um, amongst yourselves. You know, don't get the lawyers involved. Don't get... Um, uh, third parties involved, if you can help it, just because it starts to add um, additional voices, additional expense. Um, though sometimes having an objective third party involved who can look at the situation, make some recommendations, and help you resolve um, any conflicts can be also a good thing. If your lines of communication are open and you've done a good job of communicating along the way, generally speaking, um, there is, you know, there's a real possibility you can work out any disagreements through mutual agreement. The next level would be mediation, and mediation uh, involves having that third party involved. The third party is not making a decision for you or about the claim. Um, the mediator is coming in as a third party to listen objectively to both sides and help you uh, figure out a, a reasonable and mutual agreement together. If that doesn't work, there's arbitration. Um, arbitration has been pushed um, a lot over the last many years now um, as being a great alternative to trials. Sometimes that's true and sometimes that's not true. It really depends on the situation and who you have involved. Um, generally speaking, the idea of arbitration is to um, have a faster process than it would be going through the courts. Um, and something that's a little bit less formal, although generally speaking, the rules of court do apply in arbitrations. Um, arbitrations involve having a third party that acts as a judge, essentially, in, in a situation where you've got a conflict. And um, it can be binding or non-binding. If it's binding, you're stuck with that arbitrator's decision at the end of your um, arbitration process. If it's non-binding, then it's something that can be appealable. Um, in which case you can take it on to the courts if you're unhappy with the arbitration resolution. And then the final is litigation, uh, and that, of course, is uh, resolving disputes within the court system. And um, that is something that tends to, well, depending on what state you're in and what community you're in, it can be longer or shorter. Um, but it tends to be a much more drawn out process, much more formal, of course, with the, with the um, judge involved and very, very clear rules of engagement that have to be followed. Okay, so if we want to avoid disputes, and we're talking about you know, dealing with conflicts um, uh, short of, of having um, some major dispute resolution need, there are a couple of pitfalls to be careful of um, as you're going through your um, contracting and, and relationship process. Number one is unrealistic expectations. When you're starting off with your um, bids and your, your um, attempts to, to participate in a project, um, or even once you've been approved for a project and now you're in the negotiation phase, be very careful about a few things. Number one is eagerness. It is great to be eager. Eagerness uh, wins the job, you know? But pay attention to what you're wishing for here. Um, being eager is great. Overeager, however, can blind you to important information about whether this is actually an appropriate project uh, for you and how the other party will behave. So pay attention to what's going on on the other side as well, even when you're in that initial process of pitching your idea or um, uh, seeking out some relationship in order to 
get into a, a larger project, pay attention to how the other party is behaving as well. You might be so over eager to get the job that you're not paying attention to the bigger picture, um, which can make uh, for issues down the road. The next is um, miscalculating um, reality. <laughs> And this is something that I see happening all too often, especially when we're talking about artists getting involved in projects for the first time or in an area where they don't have a lot of experience. So paying attention to money, time, the ability to perform, and what you can actually do for the money that is being allocated in, in the budgeting process. So be very careful about miscalculating things or even being too optimistic about your calculations in order to feed that eagerness um, to, to get the job. So paying attention to the calculations that you're making um, is another crucial area to avoid disputes down the road. And then the last, I'm not sure why it's not, there we go, other factors. Um, so other factors to consider might be um, outside factors, things like construction schedules uh, or openings that are planned or special events. So pay attention to whether the other party is asking for impossible things from the outset. So it, it may be you who's bringing the unrealistic expectations to the table, but it might be the other party as well. If the deadline is too short um, and they're asking for the impossible to be delivered on an impossible time frame, don't agree just because you're eager to get the job. Make sure that you address that up front. Um, and if it means that you don't get the job, honestly, it's probably for the best because when things start off, on the wrong foot and with unrealistic expectations, they're almost always bound to fail and be very unpleasant. Okay, the other pitfall to think about is procrastination. I'm sure nobody here has ever procrastinated anything in their lives, but just in case you might think about it at some point, um, this second pitfall is a pretty important one. Uh, and in fact, might be one of the most deadly sins in the navigating of contracts and conflicts. When you procrastinate, you are putting yourself in danger, obviously, hopefully not physically, but um, when you are putting yourself in a place where you could be breaching a contract, um, you're looking at potentially damaging your reputation or completely botching the job, which is definitely not something that anybody sets out to do, nor do you want to have that as the result. So let's go through a couple of the um, most common reasons for procrastinating. Number one is fear. Fear of the response or the reaction from the other party, if we communicate with them that we're not able to perform in some way uh, or adhere to the original terms of the deal. So um, maybe you uh, underestimated time or budget needed to do the job properly. This is something that's not likely to get better with time. So rather than just being afraid of addressing that, make sure that you look ahead a little bit realize it's not going to get better with time and, and address the, the problem as soon as you can. Again, this goes back to the same fear and negotiation of not asking for what you want or need because you're afraid of what the response is going to be. Likely, more times than not, the response is uh, much more generous than you're thinking it's going to be. People appreciate being in the loop. They want to be able to fix the problem and work with you. And everybody pretty much knows that things come up during the course of these, um, these projects. Uh, ignoring, and this is closely related, of course, but ignoring problems um, and hoping that they're going to go away, sometimes, unfortunately, sometimes that works. And so that gives us a terrible um, incentive to continue to ignore things. But most of the time, you're not going to have that last minute uh, solution that pops up or the problem that magically goes away. Um, most of the time what happens is if you ignore the problem, it simply gets bigger and worse, your fear increases, your stress increases, and it makes the project much more difficult to even work on at all. Okay, and then um, the last issue here is um, abandoning. Um, when we worry that we've waited too long in the per and we think that the problem is now irretrievable, we commit even harder rather than coming clean and talking about what's going on and trying to resolve it through that mutual agreement process and communication process. Um, and we might just walk away from the problem. Um, and in that way, we're committing even harder to the procrastination and, and basically abandoning the work. Um, that's a really bad place to be in. And that's usually where we see things completely fall apart and 
uh, become much more serious conflicts um, that are harder and more expensive to get out of. So don't do any of these things. Issues come up all the time in projects and in, in commitments. It's important that you do your best to communicate these challenges right away. And most of the time, everybody understands um, they, they know that these things happen and there are options to rethink what needs to happen in order to move forward in the most productive way possible. So we will end with some do's and don'ts and hopefully you all have some questions that we can address um, shortly as well. So do communicate, empathize, take time and use contracts. I think we pretty much covered all those things, but if you have any questions about that, let's talk about it. And definitely do not be unrealistic um, about what, what you can do or what the other side is asking you to do. Don't procrastinate and don't hesitate to ask for help. It's really important to know when you're in over your head and ask for that help. None of us is perfect at everything. And so it's important to um, take the time and get that support when it's necessary. Okay. So, as you can see, I started with the, um, the little chicks, the ducks in a row, and the broken egg to symbolize conflict. So here, I guess I can end by saying keep your eggs together, right? <laughs> okay, thank you for listening, and uh, let's uh, deal with some questions. I, can, I guess I can stop sharing my screen so that maybe I can see the chat. Um, we don't have any questions in the chat box. Um, does anyone have any questions for Sarah that you you can unmute yourself and ask them? I covered all of it. Every last bit of conflicts. <laughs> well, maybe I can ask some of my co-hosts on the call, Ed or um, Sarah. Um, does anyone have an anecdote that they that they could share of um, an experience where there was a conflict um, in an artist situation that was successfully resolved? There are no conflicts in the city of Phoenix. Everything <laughs> is in smooth. the world, apparently. Sailing. Everything is smooth sailing. Well, I'm wondering if anyone has questions about um, contract provisions or the process of resolving conflicts, because that can sometimes be a little bit challenging. Um, or if any of the artists on the call maybe have a, um, uh, an inspiring story of how they've worked out a conflict on their own rather than having to resort to the expensive and time consuming official processes. No, well, I, I will say that a lot of um, a lot of what I do, I do not do litigation. I did litigation at the beginning of my career, and I really did not enjoy it. Uh, unfortunately, I take things way too personally to be a good litigator. So I took that litigation experience and um, brought it to transactions instead because I could see where things would fall apart and what would happen if it went too far in terms of the conflict um, process. So a lot of what I end up doing is talking with artists um, at that moment when they're struggling with what to do. I mean, as you can all probably imagine, um, the first thing that artists think of when there's a problem or a conflict on a project is not to call a lawyer necessarily. Um, but by the time that they do call me, there's usually a pretty high amount of stress. And um, it's important sometimes to take a step back and look at really what the problems are and how it's kind of grown and affected the ability to uh, approach a project and do the work that's necessary to complete the project. Um, so what I found is that generally speaking with most conflicts, this is not all conflicts of course, but with most conflicts, what's needed is some additional language, right? Some, uh, a, a new perspective and maybe a way of wording um, an email or um, some words to call and, and, and have a personal conversation, but some way to communicate. And so oftentimes artists are much more, um, they have their heads in their work and not so much um, thinking about the communications aspect of it. This is a vast generalization, of course, there are many very articulate artists as well. But when we're emotionally 
overwhelmed by a situation, sometimes it can be hard to find the right words to approach the other party. And we have, you know, a, a physical reaction when we try to do that. So I see my role oftentimes with artists to kind of cut through the emotion and, and look at things, not that I don't have my own emotions, but for your project, you know, I'm not emotionally uh, uh, invested. And to cut through a lot of that emotion and help artists come up with words or, you know, it could be the project managers or, you know, whichever side of the agreement we're talking about to come up with the words to address the issue and open the door to having those productive conversations around resolving any conflicts. Um, and in fact, what I found is that it's actually something I'm really good at. And I'm so good at it that I was doing it for free day in and day out because people would call to say, do I need to hire you? Do I need a lawyer? And I would talk with them for a little bit and um, resolve it, you know, in 30 or 40 minutes of conversation and a few um, helpful comments about how to word an email. And that would be the last I ever heard. So I started doing instead office hours because, of course, um, it's hard to sustain a practice on free clients all the time. Um, and so I have now office hours that I, I um, have available on my website. And that's for specifically these kinds of situations where really you just need a little bit of help, a little bit of insight, um, but not necessarily hiring a lawyer for the long term um, litigation process, which I wouldn't be doing anyway. Um, and I find that that little bit of support sometimes can be very helpful. Now, obviously, I'm not the only person around who can do this. There are quite a lot of lawyers who are excellent at helping people resolve problems. There are also um, programs in a lot of communities through Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts. Um, and those programs offer either free or reduced cost legal services for people in the arts. Um, again, some of them are better than others in terms of the lawyers that they draw from the community to provide those um, supports. But that's an important resource to know about, uh, certainly for all artists. I see I, that uh, Natalie says she's got a question. Yay, Natalie, what's your question? <laughs> so, hi, Sarah. Hi. Um, I've worked with Sarah and I can speak to exactly what she says, you know, when you're in the midst of something and you're like, oh my gosh, she's a good voice of reason. So I guess I had a question knowing that a lot of this comes with experience and seeing it a few times and seeing it work out or seeing what works better. Um, short of having all of that experience, are there ways that, um, yeah, I don't know that, that you can practice or get I get more perspective or something like that. You know, I'm just thinking about this because, you know, I was having some conversations earlier today and just thinking, you know, in 10 years, all of this will be so much clearer. <laughs> but right now, it's still nerve wracking. And um, and so I'm, I'm just wondering, are there short of just having to live through the hard knocks and the things that go well? You know, are there other things, other things we can practice, other things we can read? I mean, there may be no other way than just sort of straight through the thing, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that in in a lot of cases, um, education comes through pain, unfortunately. And so, so often artists will learn those really excellent lessons by messing something up and having it be painful. Now, obviously, that's not, you know, that's not ideal. But um, in fact, that is part of what experience is. And as you go through those projects over and over again, you learn something from each one of them. And you'll see even even companies, you know, their contracts uh, change over time based on what problems they have. Then they run back and change a provision to deal with whatever problem just came up that they had not thought of, because we can't possibly think of every potential issue that's going to come up. Um, however, uh, as much as I, I, I guess I'm showing myself as a an aging lawyer now to say that people need to earn their stripes, right? The young people need to work harder and, and experience all these things. But at the same time, that's not um, always necessary. And you can learn from other people's mistakes, or you can um, at least have a better understanding of a position that might be more advantageous to take. And I think that comes through mentorship. So unfortunately, um, there's never enough mentorship to go around. Um, but occasionally, you can find that person who's willing to uh, be um, a, a resource for you. And so I would suggest that, you know, artists, it's tough for artists. Oftentimes artists are working very much on their own and there's a lot of isolation. Um, 
but uh, finding those other artists who are willing to be mentors, learning from their experiences, um, or attending things like this. You know, when you, you've got an opportunity, especially now that we're all sitting at home still, um, trying to, you know, make our way through each day, there are a lot of webinars and resources available online, um, certainly that you can look to. And of course, I can't give up uh, an opportunity to uh, plug my book. I do think that I mean, the, the reason I wrote the book in the first place was I was tired of charging artists for an hour of my time. And when I was saying the same thing over and over again, so I put all that into the contracts book and, and I have heard from artists that that's been helpful for them too. So those are my suggestions for what it's worth. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I do have a couple questions that have come in um, okay. privately. The first one is, do you have any advice on choosing between mediation and arbitration, especially when it comes to dealing with disputes with galleries and auction houses? Sure. Well, mediation and arbitration are two really different choices. Um, and generally speaking, even if arbitration is called for in an agreement, you can mediate. Mediation can be something that people just agree to do because people want to avoid going through the arbitration or litigation process. I always recommend if there's a window of possibility that you can work things out in a mediation setting, it is a much less draining process. That's not to say that it can't still be emotional and difficult. But mediating something is always something that I would really, really push for people to consider and, and you know, try to be open to. The fact of the matter is that people go into um, litigation, whether it's arbitration or actual, um, you know, in court litigation, with this idea that they're going to come out and show the world that they're right and they're going to win. Well, oftentimes winning doesn't really feel like winning, and you really have to be cautious about going to court in order to seek justice, right? We've heard a lot about that with um, the last few months and um, all of the challenges that our, our um, legal system poses in that regard. So keep it in mind, like it, it's, not, um, it's not necessarily the way to get to the solution that you want. Mediation gives you a much better way to get to what you want. It gives you a lot more flexibility if there's um, a, a willingness on both sides to consider um, a, a, a more speedy and, and mutually agreeable way of resolving it. This is another reason why I really highly recommend that people address conflicts before they get too far down the road. It's when things become super acrimonious and people are really, really angry and entrenched in their positions that things like mediation really can't work. Otherwise, you know, most people who are thinking along the lines of what's the best business solution, um, coming up with some way of, of settling it. And, you know, they always say that the, the sign of a good mediation is that everyone walks away equally unhappy. I mean, hopefully it's equally happy as well. But the fact of the matter is, is that it's, it is about compromise. And so um, I'm a huge proponent of when you have a conflict, addressing it with a rational perspective, um, being realistic about what the possible outcomes are. And I, I'm not really in favor of the attitude of let's go smash the other guy. I really do think that the better attitude is let's figure out from a creative and emotional perspective, as well as the financial and business perspective, what the best solution here is and do, do our best to get there. So um, I guess that uh, that answers it in that I would say as much as possible, I push for mediation, um, arbitration and litigation would be secondary. When you're dealing with galleries and auction houses, oftentimes those things are um, set out in the contracts. There are very particular provisions that um, establish how dispute resolution is going to take place. And, um, you know, it, depending on who you're representing, let's say you're representing the artist or you are the artist, um, Galleries and auction houses have a lot more money. They, generally speaking, they've got a lot more um, ability to ride out the situation in a litigation process um, than you might. And so uh, you don't want to be in a position where you're just going to be buried by the fact that you have fewer resources than the other side. So, again, mediation provides a, a good way to um, have a, a little bit of a more level playing field and hopefully get to a mutually agreeable resolution. Great. Um, we have another question about indemnity, um, which is a term that we hear a lot in museums and galleries and at public art. Um, 
but is that something that can pertain to all types of artists, performing artists as well? Yeah, indemnity can pertain to any contract whatsoever. So it's a it's a very typical clause. And anyone who hasn't seen the movie Double Indemnity, it's a good movie. You should definitely watch it. It'll help you understand what the word indemnity means. Um, yeah, I mean, indemnification is something that is frequently put into contracts to make sure that um, that whoever is responsible for a problem arising ends up being responsible and, and isn't just responsible after a lawsuit, but is responsible according to the terms of the contract um, and that they have a responsibility to make the other party whole, meaning paying whatever costs, um, you know, and, and taking care of um, whatever um, the damages and liability uh, have resulted in. So indemnification, the, the term indemnification and those indemnification clauses are important to be familiar with because for exactly the reason I just stated, which is that they're in almost every contract. There's at the end of the contract, um, usually you'll see a series of pretty standard boilerplate clauses. When I say boilerplate, the um, categories are boilerplate, but the language can differ from contract to contract. So things like um, establishing the venue and the place, the location where any disputes will be resolved. So that'll name a city or a state um, or a country where uh, disputes will be resolved and indemnification and um, any termination provisions may be in there and um, uh, a section that talks about, you know, this being the entire agreement. So when you see a paragraph that says entire agreement or um, uh, Integration clause is what it, what it's called technically, and that means that you know verbal agreements outside the four um, sides of that contract are not going to be effective. And it means that every everything that you've agreed to is within that document. So there are these boilerplate um, clauses that come in at the end of agreements. You'll see indemnification amongst those. So Sarah, just to kind of build on that and ask a question. One thing that I like to do as a project manager is when I have an artist who's getting ready to sign a contract, I like to sit down with them in a face-to-face -face meeting or a Zoom meeting and walk through each of those conflicts. That way they have a chance to ask questions because just handing them 30 pages of paper and saying, reading it. Is that something you would encourage artists to do is to have a have a meeting and go over those contracts clauses. Yes, and I think um, you raised two really important issues. One is simply taking the time to go through the contract. And I understand that I am an anomaly in the human race that I love contracts and most people find them dreadful. <laughs> I'm glad to see you like them too, Katie. <laughs> um, and so, you know, oftentimes I'll, 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 when I represent somebody, I'll draft a contract for them and say, let's go over it next week. And of course, when we get on the phone or on Zoom, they haven't looked at anything because, of course, every time they read the first line, their eyes droop and they go to sleep. I get it. So it does sometimes help to have a set meeting where you go through each and every provision and make sure that there's a clear understanding. And, you know, like even when I'm drafting things, or I'm sure when you're going over things with artists, stuff comes up and you go, oh yeah, you know what? We should actually probably change that and, and make that something different, slightly different for this particular situation. So yes, I think that's an excellent uh, process to, to make um, part of the, the business process that artists go through. The second thing I will say is that it's really important to understand um, who you're talking to when you go through those contracts. So obviously if I have a client and they're going through it with me, I represent them. So my job is to make sure that that contract is the best contract for them. If they're talking to you, you're lovely and you're wonderful, and I'm sure you're not trying to do anything terrible to the artist, but you don't represent them. You're trying to make a collaborative agreement um, and something that's gonna be good for both parties, but you ultimately represent the city of Phoenix. And so it's important for artists to understand who they're talking to and what their role is. Um, it may be that that's totally fine, you know, because because there's no um, aspect of that contract that is going to end up tripping anybody up as long as everyone agrees to it. It might, on the other hand, be that you're not really able to provide them with exactly the representation that they need um, to, to go through every provision thoughtfully in terms of how it affects their own practice and how they can um, um, satisfy every aspect of that contract. 
The third thing to think about is when you have art consultants involved or booking agents or some middle person galleries, you know, who's involved where they sort of represent somebody or they represent one party, but they're sort of sitting in the middle of those relationships. And um, what I have found is that most art consultants that I work with um, are hired by, say, the developer or by um, a municipality to manage the project. And that's great. Like having an art consultant involved can be super helpful. They are they tend to be you know knowledgeable and um, understand how these projects go. That's also not always true, right? You you may have consultants who don't really know what they're doing and have gotten the job in some other um, you know way based on who they know, um, and that's okay too. But but again, understanding who that art consultant represents can be crucial because oftentimes artists will rely very heavily on an agent or a manager or an art consultant thinking that that person is looking out for their best interests when in fact they're not. And so again, paying attention to who um, who is, what, what people's interests are, who they represent um, and what their motivations are. Again, this goes back to that empathy piece. Understanding where people are coming from is really crucial in figuring out who's actually there to help you and who has an interest that might be divergent from yours. Oh, can't hear you, Katie. How about now? Is that better? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, one more question that I think might be helpful, and you may have mentioned it in your presentation, but should an artist have a standard template template contract um, in their back pocket in case they're they've entered a, a, a relationship with someone and the other party doesn't have one yes and no so i'm going to give the typical lawyer answer of it depends um, i often am asked to create template agreements and the problem with that is that every single project in every single situation is unique and different so i hesitate to give people templates and say you can use this for any project you get involved in because they might not necessarily know exactly what needs to be adjusted in each case. That said, I think that it is really valuable for people to have templates or forms that they can look to so that they understand the general flow and, and way in which um, contracts operate and what tends to be included and what's not. So um, it can be helpful to have a template, but just because you have a template when you're talking about something like a model release that is, you know, a paragraph long that's giving you the right to use somebody's um, name and likeness in a particular situation, a model release can be fairly standard, right? That language is not going to change necessarily from, from project to project. Um, but when you're talking about a commission agreement where every aspect of each project changes, the scope of the agreement, the payment schedule, the milestones, the you know, the, the way in which the project is going to roll out. So much of it may be different. It's different fabrication processes, different approval processes. So then you get into like rewriting the whole contract anyway. So um, templates can be helpful. They can be, I would say, more than um, a tool to rely on. They can be something to educate people about what aspects of um, an agreement need to be uh, put into writing. So there's, we're back to my, it depends. <laughs> okay, we're coming close to the end. We have about four minutes left. Does anybody else have a question that they'd like to pose before we um, say goodbye for the day? So I think we're gonna be talking about intellectual property next week. Okay. Um, which I'm really looking forward to. And of course that becomes uh, very important in in conflicts because it tends to uh, be one of the main areas that people argue over <laughs> before they sign contracts or even surprisingly afterwards when they realize they've signed away their intellectual property rights. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to doing that. Hopefully people can join us again next week and we'll continue the progress through the legal issues. Yes. And again, so sorry for our technical difficulties today, everyone. Uh, we will be posting these on YouTube and we'll send you all an email to let you know when they're available. Um, last week's is not up yet, but will be soon. Um, yeah, if you need anything, please uh, let us know at the Office of Arts and Culture. Thanks so much. Thanks, Sarah. That was great. Thank you. Thanks.